Good afternoon, this is Ken again, and today I'm going to talk about pneumatics. Pneumatics are really cool, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. But first off, you need to understand what pneumatics are as opposed to hydraulics. Pneumatics are when you're dealing with compressible fluids. Uh, typically in uh, first row bikes we're talking about air. Pneumatics can either be a closed system like a, a, a small cylinder like this where the air is actually entrapped inside of a containment or they can open systems like a turbine blade. But today let's talk principally about closed systems such as these air cylinders. The bottom line is that uh, pneumatics provide force and the force is a very simple equation that simply says that the pressure you put into a cylinder multiply that by the area of the piston and that results in a force at the other end. And so it's just as simple as that. There's very little calculations associated with that. And so if you look at what happens in a pneumatic system, it always starts with some source. For example, the source could be an air compressor. Um, and this is the newest of the air compressors that have been giving out in FRC. There was a, a similarly powerful, maybe a little bit more powerful um, compressor that's been used in the past. Uh, if you're talking about some of those systems, you may not use an air compressor on the robot, but rather store the energy in some sort of an accumulator. Uh, often they're used in conjunction, but it starts out with the air compressor. Next thing it's going to go to is to a regulator. The regulator can be a fixed or, or, or adjustable like this one is, and that's designed so that you can limit your downstream pressure to power your cylinders to something which is, number one, legal by the rules, and number two, the minimum you need to do your job. We'll talk about that a little bit later on, but, but regulators are important because if you use more pressure than you need, you simply deplete your system earlier than it has to happen. Out of the regulator, it'll come into solenoids. These are the electronic controllers. Here's one that's going to be used with very small cylinders, such as the little VEX cylinders I showed there, the small ones. And this would be one that's typically used for uh, cylinders that might be on an FRC robot. There's larger ones available too. From these electronically controlled solenoids, then it simply goes to the tubes, which then go to your cylinders. And that provides you the, the forces on there. En route between the solenoid and the, um, the cylinder, there could be a couple of clever things called flow controls. And these flow controls are very, very useful. We'll talk about those a little bit more, but that'd be the one other component that might be in your system. Flow controls to control the, the speed at which these cylinders operate. Given the broad spectrum of parts that go in here, there's a lot of things that can go right with pneumatics, but there's also quite a bit of complexity. So let's think about what is important and why pneumatics are, are very useful. What is the best thing about them? Well, the number one thing uh, that I like to claim is that there's no magic smoke. No matter how much you abuse these, these characters, unless you use them as a hammer, I suppose, but you can overload them, you can run them against uh, maximum load for, um, for minutes on end, and they're happy. They do not burn up or overheat like a motor would, and so that's one very important consideration. The other part is that unlike a motor where you, you, you'd like to grab something, but you don't really know how much force you're putting on them. Uh, you run it to, for a while and say, oh, let's stop it now. It must be the right, right force. Pneumatics provide a very controlled force, and you can control that exactly by setting the pressure that you want to your cylinder. And it's a very controlled, very constant. If you want to put a lot of force into a motor-driven item, then you have to have a very large gear reduction in order to get that torque multiplied to the point where you really develop a lot of force. The cool thing about air cylinders is that they can have very high speed when there's no load, and yet still have high force. So it's a combination of high speed when unloaded and high force. The other part, which is kind of a mixed blessing with uh, air cylinders, is that you have two very distinct endpoints you know exactly where those are going to be. There are quite a few applications where you need to have two distinct endpoints and so those are provided. One strategic reason for using pneumatics on a competitive robot is that they can store energy. And they can store energy without having any electrical cost. For example, if you want something to happen at the end of a match and your battery becomes disconnected at the end of the match, well these will still do that action. So that's one good thing about them. And they also um, unlike a motor, which may slowly unwind after you take the power off, an air cylinder will keep that force indefinitely, provided you don't have too many leaks. So that's another really good thing for them strategically. Before we get into how you can use these and where you can use them, let me tell you about things that often go wrong though when people use pneumatics. And it's one reason why pneumatics aren't used by more teams, I suspect. 
Okay, here is a, the contemporary compressor that's been given with most FRC kits. You, you should understand that the maximum power that comes out of any size cylinder is going to be limited to what comes out of here. Now this particular motor will draw about 12 amps, but it's actually only about a 50 watt motor. And then by the time it gets through the compressor, it, it cuts down probably to about 40 watts of air pressure by the time it gets down to the uh, cylinder. And the cylinder's gonna have a little bit of reduction there too from efficiency and friction. So basically, you're limited to about 30, 35, 40 watts is maximum you're gonna get no matter what size cylinder you have. Now, having said that, you can get some very high peak powers. Uh, for example, in, in the 2014 robot, FRC 190 used a couple of these 12 inch cylinders as air springs where they were compressed with, to 6 inches, charged to 60 psi, and then allowed to fire off. Now it turns out that's about 370 pounds when you have two of these side by side when they're charged 60 psi. And they would react within about, they go to full 6 inch extension in about a tenth of a second. If you look at that, that that's a peak of around 1000 watts. So it's about 30 times more than the sustained power, but it is available only for, for periods of less than a second, which is okay for a lot of applications. So thinking about what these things can do, let's talk about uh, practical applications for where they should be. Number one, since they have two distinct positions, you might think of them as a gate. A very good application would be as a gate or a lifter, something which only has two positions of interest. Particularly if you have one that has, to, which is desirable to have stored energy at some position. For example, as a transmission shifter. Now you can transmission shift using a servo or you can use it as a pneumatic. The example of a servo is that of course when you command a servo it tries to get that position but if it doesn't and then it just holds that energy which is fine except for the fact that it's a motor inside as we talked previously electric motors under stall overheat and the same thing would happen with a servo. These little cylinders can hold that pressure indefinitely until the cogs align up so the shift can be completed and they're very happy at that. So it's a really good example for pneumatics and shifters. If you have some sort of an, uh, of an arm or shoulder that has to go through some limited arc, and I'm saying about 60 degrees, try not to get over 90 degrees of arc. Limited arc rotary angles work pretty well. Um, here's an example. In 2006 we used a uh, pneumatic to uh, lift balls into spinning wheels for a, um, a basketball Nerf ball thrower. Perfectly good application for it because a little three-quarter inch cylinder there would lift our, our, um, our balls in no problem. Now we actually had a three-quarter inch diameter bore and six inch cylinder had to raise these balls about four inches into the shooting wheels. And we wanted to make this, this happen as quickly as possible so we actually uses, used one of the really nice things about um, about uh, air cylinders, which are magnetic switches. When you put a magnetic switch around an air cylinder, you just strap it on anywhere you want to along, along there, it can actually detect when the piston goes through there. And which means that even though it doesn't control the cylinder, it does provide you with great information to your computer about when the cylinder has moved and when it, where it is in its state. So if you want to have something which lifts things up quickly and you want to make sure you don't waste time, then you put a little limit switch up here, or this read switch rather, and every time it comes through that, they would know that it's finished that cycle and it can repeat. So we were able to shoot uh, three quarters of a second for each ball lift in that year and it worked out quite well. There is something to think about with cylinders. Remember we said the force equals pressure times area. So you'd be tempted to just look at the bore of this thing and multiply it by um, you know, pi r squared and come up with the pressure and you come up with the force that's being applied there. Now that is fine except for the fact that is pushing in a pulling force which is often used as well. When you pull you have less area. And if that's not clear it's because this diameter of the shaft itself occupies some of the annular area, some of that circular area of the bore, and so that is not available for developing force. So by convention, almost every cylinder you'd be using for first, or FRC, will develop about 10% more force in pushing than in pulling. It's easy to calculate, but you need to think about that. Another good example is when you have a gripper, something that wants to grab onto a ball. We use this, in a lot of games you do that. Um, Actually, it turns out the Max are really good for doing this. In 2001 and then later on in 2004, um, there, were, there, was a very, there was a very large ball, 30 inch diameter balls. And we discovered that we needed about 10 pounds of force to, to maintain that ball adequately. 
So we decided to use pneumatics. On the picture you can see how we actually did this. We actually had two arms that were geared together and the reason for doing that is that when you activate only one arm you can limit the arc. We had arms that had to go like 90 degrees but if you're only controlling one with a air cylinder you can limit that to 45 degrees, about half of that, which really improves the mechanical advantage. If you do the math, mathematics you'd find out that we need, we had about a three inch lever arm for our cylinder to act upon and we had 15 inches out here at the center of a 30 inch ball. So that meant there was a 5 to 1 um, leverage there we had to deal with. So in this case we used a 1 and a half inch bore by 3 inch length cylinder. Now that seems like a lot of force as 1 and a half inches and, and do that calculation comes up to be 106 pounds of force available from the cylinder. But remember we had a 5 to 1 ratio of the 3 inch operating leverage and then 15 inches to the center of a 30 inch ball. That's 5 to 1. And then you had a multiplier there because you had the two arms geared together, which meant the effective ratio was 10 to 1, which meant that 106 pounds did become 10 and a half pounds, 10.6 pounds, which is exactly what we wanted. There was another kind of a nice feature about this particular uh, mechanism, which is a good advantage of pneumatics. When you grab something which can roll away from you, you want to grab it quickly. These are balls. We want to grab it quickly. On the other hand, we had to lift it up and then balance it on top of a precarious um, tower. We want, to re we want to let it go gently so you can see if it's going to be balanced or not. And if it starts to roll off, you grab it quickly. With a motor, you can't really do that very easily. You can't control the speeds one way or the other as easily. With pneumatics, by using flow controls, we could have a very quick grab and a slow, methodic opening. So, Talking about these little bits and pieces now, first off, let me go over again the function of the regulators. Regulators can be this size for an FRC or these little teeny ones like this for a, a VEX robot. These will take whatever pressure you have stored in your accumulator and then reduce them down to what pressure you can use for your systems. This is really important to do this because unregulated, first off, you may break the rules of your competition, which for FRC is 60 pounds. But more importantly, you'll use more energy out of your accumulators than you need to. You should use the least amount of pressure as possible. So that's one cool thing. Now, on the other hand, there are these little connectors which go into your cylinders in place of these other connectors. And these are flow control valves. Flow control valves do not change the pressure but they do operate as a one-way reduction. So when air comes into them, it comes in unrestricted. No matter what happens, the air is always coming in this direction unrestricted. But when you close down the valve, it allows air to come out very slowly on the outlet. And so by using these on both ends of a double acting cylinder, you can independently control the closure versus the opening. And that is a very, very useful device. But don't be confused that it does not change the net force available. This may operate very, very slowly, but it still would develop the entire force, no matter how much you have a control with the flow control. So it controls speed, but not force. Now, the solenoids themselves, these are the electronic devices. And of course, these will receive a digital signal from your controller and operate the cylinders in one way or the other. They require very, very little power, and yet they can control something which develops hundreds of pounds of force. So some general suggestions about pneumatics. Let's look about the weight of the system. Obviously, this weight can be very significant. Because of that, here at FRC 190, we have a system in place that we never use pneumatics unless there are at least two independent systems that are really benefited by using them. If we only find one application for it, then we'll try to make do with some other non-pneumatic solution. Never ever tolerate leaks. You know, um, people think, oh, well, pneumatics are always going to leak. Well, we don't, you don't tolerate having a short of electricity on your chassis of your robot, nor should you tolerate having a leak of your system. They shouldn't leak. They should hold pressure forever. Well, for a long time. Now, we've been doing FRC ourselves for about 23 years now, and I think by my uh, calculations, about 21 of those, there have been pneumatics available for them. To show you what we think about them, um, I think by my most recent count, 14 years of the 21, we have actually used pneumatics. So we like them. They work pretty well. The weight is always manageable if you use multiple systems. And when used appropriately, it's really hard to beat them. Grabbers, a shifter, a lifter, two position lifter, and now we're pretty happy about them using them as air springs. So the next time your team is looking at a new challenge, I encourage you to look at those applications such as these the way they might work. And then try them. You might be surprised how well they will do the job.